Hello and welcome to another live testimony time. I have my wonderful brother in Christ, Nasser Al Qahtani. My <laughs> qay is not as <laughs> as um, um, Arabic as it could be, but or should be, but it is Nasser Al Qahtani, as best as I can uh, pronounce it. It's an honor to have you, brother. I asked. <laughs> Ooh. I have the uh, audio on in that on, on the video on the YouTube channel, but uh, thank you for being here, brother. Uh, I asked a question from the YouTube community: who to, who should I have next? And they in introduced me to you. I emailed you, and you were um, open enough to answer the email. And today we're sitting to chat a little bit and share your testimony and answer some of the questions of the audience. Please mm -hmm. go ahead, introduce yourself. Thank you, brother. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for reaching out. It's my, my great pleasure uh, to have the opportunity to, to get to know another brother in Christ, especially from Iran. Um, you know, I grew up um, not having kind feelings towards the people on the other side of the Khalid. But, um, <laughs> but now, man, I'm so thankful to God for many, many brothers and sisters that I now have um, in Christ Amen. from uh, the wonderful nation of Iran and such a beautiful Beautiful country, such a diverse country, beautiful people. And I, I long for the day when when my people and your people can, um, you know, eat and break bread together openly in the Middle East. I'm praying for that. And I believe it will happen one day um, uh, as more of us have, you know, come to the Lord and that yes. all of hostility is broken down. Um, in the so that is exciting. Absolutely exciting. And um, I don't know, is there something in the Middle East? This separation with the borders and the separation with the waters, separation with the mountains, everything is animosity. Yeah. I don't, Iranian says, well, Afghans, they're enemies. And then Iranians and Iraqis are, and Ir Iraqis and Syrians and Syrians yeah. and Turks and Iranians and Turks. It's amazing. And then, of course, it divides itself to Sunni Shias. Yes. And then it comes to uh, Iran and Air uh, Saudi. Right. There used to be a good relationship, but it just grew hostile and hostile and hostile. And then the Yemenis, the Houthis got involved in the whole thing. I'm Iranian. You're from um, Saudi. Yeah. And we both sometimes in our lives, somehow Jesus, out of his grace, reached out and saved yeah. us. And now we can sit and talk. So good. <laughs> without hostility, yeah. without hostility, and and uh, <laughs> be friend and nobody dies. So, brother, um, can you tell us uh, where where you grow up? How did you end up in America? And sure. what's what's the story that everyone yeah. wants to hear? Oh, it's it's a long story. So I'll just give you the um, the bigger details, and feel free mm -hmm. to to dive in or ask questions on anything um, that you want or anything that the uh, the viewers want to know more about. Uh, but I grew up in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia, so um, we're literally right across the Gulf yes. from you guys. And uh, uh, my uh, upbringing, like that part of Saudi, if you know the country, that actually is where many of the Shia people in Saudi are. Um, our yes. city was a Sunni city. We were very proud of that. We mm -hmm. looked down on the Shia people. I, I'm laughing. Mm -hmm. It's sad. It's really sad because we yes. should have been you know, countrymen and brothers and sisters. And there was such division because of um, that separation. Even, even within Saudi? Even, oh, of course. Oh, my goodness, brother. I I could talk to you, tell you stories for an hour about um, the, the suffering of Shia people in, in Saudi. It's like a cuss word, actually, in the Muslim world. If you're, a, if you're in a majority Shia and you're a Sunni, it's like it's literally when when we wanted to use a cuss word, you're like, are you a Sunni Muslim? You know, it's like some uh, uh, apostate. Or when it comes to uh, Christians, yeah. oh my god, oh Jews, oh it just gets the the levels of yeah, it's getting worse. It just grows. So yeah, go it's ahead. Not, so I didn't know it's yeah. that bad even within yeah, it's, a, it's, a country it's itself. Not great, you know? it's not great. I'm, I'm not going to say it's the worst ever of anywhere, but. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly wasn't good. And even as a young person, I noticed it. I noticed the difference. I noticed how people were treated based on whether they were Sunni or Shia, whether they were a, a real Arab or not, whether what country they were from. Um, you know, we weren't, not all Muslims are equal. There is, was, was the reality. I know we were yes. taught that. It was being preached to us, 
but it wasn't the reality that anyone was experiencing, at least in, in my city in my day. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't really, honestly, didn't spend too much time dwelling on that. I was mm -hmm. from the right background. I was from the right lineage, right. checking yeah. all the boxes. So I was okay. Felt a little bad for the other people, but I was I was good. And uh, and I gave who else could I think about God for that? And so I would thank God for that, you know, that I was born into this family and to live in this nation and be from this group and just feeling totally blessed um, by God. And I, I grew up, um, you know, uh, going through school in the 1980s. And, and this was a time in, in my country where, you know, the, the school system was really beginning to push um, a more conservative Islamic viewpoint, worldview on, on younger people. Um, I think, honestly, a reaction to what happened in Iran in the 1970s had kind of a ripple effect on other nations. Absolutely, I agree. Yeah. Saudi was no exception. And so it was really like we want to be devout people. We don't want to be secular. We want to take our religion seriously. Um, and that, and what- Would you, would you yeah. explain, would you explain what happened? Because you, 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 ref, uh, you reference a date. Yes. And many probably don't know what happened in 1978, 1979. Yeah. What happened in Iran that caused that ripple effect, that, that wave of growth, uh, of the um, growth of Islam or, or just reviving back Islam? to the roots of it. Would, right. you, would, you, would you let us know what happened? Well, you probably know better than I do, but but there was a revolution, right? There was a, a, a regime change and the the country that was formula, formula, formerly secular. Very much. Uh, and mm -hmm. open, open to the West, open to tourism. <laughs> like it's, I think people today can't even imagine what Iran must have been like wow. 40, 50 years ago, but it was a different world. And, and just the same, it was actually a different, um, world and the other, the Arab nations mm -hmm. um, to the to the west and to the south of Iran. Mm -hmm. You can look at pictures, even in my country, of what daily life was like and how much more free and open it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Praise God, things are changing now in Saudi Arabia, and the the mm -hmm. country is becoming more open now. It's more open now than it's been in a long time. But but it's actually uh, going back to the way things used to be. It's not a new thing. And and what happened after the the Islamic revolution in Iran is, is people began to shut things down. Anything the West was seen as bad, anything that was viewed as secular was seen as bad. You know, music was bad suddenly. All of these things, and it was like, we have to go back. Um, and many people, you know, way it was taught to us, we have to go back to the pure Islam. To the roots, to, to the, the roots. first century. The original, yeah. yeah. And, we, and so if we didn't have it back then, then we don't need it now. Correct. It's kind of like we got to go backwards. We got to go backwards because that was the good old days, and yeah. so that was what was taught to us. And and, and the Ayatollah of Iran, Ayatollah yep. of Iran, when 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 the Islamic Revolution happened, that was like if it can if it can happen in a Shia Muslim country, and they can take it all the way from a very secular country to the Islamic Sharia. Yeah. Just Islamic courts, Islamic ruling, Islamic anything, Islamic media. Right. Why can't we do which Islam was originated in Saudi? Why right. can't they? And that was like the message mm -hmm. to Afghanistan, to Pakistan, to Iraq, name the country, Egypt. Sure. It was like this can be possible. And the movement started. And then during those times was that, okay, we need to get more serious about our Islamic faith. Yeah. And yeah. then you are in a school and you are getting the Islamic yeah, we've got to do it. And we've got to be bold for our faith. We've got to defend mm -hmm. our faith, um, even at the cost of our lives. That's and it. Jihad was talked about, I mean, from the time that my earliest memories, like that was the thing. And so in the 80s, there was uh, some wars going on in the Middle East. You had what was going on in Afghanistan. You know, and then you also had the war um, between Iraq and Iran. Going Eight years, same time, a terrible war. Mm -hmm. um, and as a young person, even in elementary school, I, I remember thinking, "Well, I I want to be if someone's fighting for God, I want to be in the fight." That's right. I want to fight for God. I want to do my part. And you know, I I was just clever enough to kind of understand that if 
in according to Islam, you know, it was my my faithfulness, my obedience mm -hmm. to the commandments of God was what was going to help me to have a chance to enter paradise when I died. Um, and that was, but you know, at the end of, end of my life, who knows, maybe how the balance scales are gonna go. I can do my best, but I'm only a, hu a human, right? But if I die, like it was so clear to me, if I die as a martyr, it's guaranteed. That's it. So which, which of the, you have two options, you know, even if it one was 99%, if the other one's 100, you're a fool to go any other direction to choose anything else. And I remember as a young person thinking, well, I just want to die as a martyr. That would be the best thing for me. And then you see that how martyrdom and how the people that they have died, how they are honored, yeah, glorified, and how they're glorified, how their death is actually celebrated. Yeah. You see, you're as a young person, you're like, what can what can be better than that? Yeah. What can better happen to me? How can I better honor my family? Yeah, honor my family, honor That's God. It. That's it. Mm -hmm. I thought it's great. And so, you know, with Iraq, Iran, like I, I, I'm sorry to say I, I had a favorite in that fight and it wasn't Iran. Like we all wanted Iran to lose. But at the same time, I thought, well, I don't want to go there and, and fight Shia Muslims, because, you know, again, I live in the Eastern province. I have neighbors, I have friends I go to school with that are Shia. I don't hate them. I think they're wrong, but I don't hate them. I don't want them to die. And so I don't want to be involved in that. That's not a, a jihad I want to be involved in. Yeah. But with Afghanistan, who was the uh, opponent there? Well, it was the Soviet Union. It was Russia. You know, they're all a bunch of atheists. They're, you know, they're kuffar, right? So I have no problem going and fighting them. And, and killing them and or being killed on the battlefield with them. So I thought, I want to go there. I want to get involved. Um, and so I was just waiting for my time, waiting for the opportunity. Um, I had a few friends in school who were just a, a couple years older than me. They had, were making plans to go to, to Pakistan, get trained, cross the border um, into Afghanistan to join the fight. Wow. And I thought, this is, this is what I want to do. And uh, even as the war... Uh, started kind of coming to an end. I still wanted to go and join because those groups were still there. They were still active. And so I just wanted to join them. I wanted to be with my, you know, Mujahideen brothers. Exactly. Um, and uh, fortunately, by the grace of God, you know, I didn't, my plan wasn't successful because instead what happened was my family and I came to the U.S. for the summer um, in 1990 for a vacation, family vacation. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. And, and something totally shocking happened at the end of that summer, right before we were able to return home, which was Saddam Hussein, who we'd all been cheering for through the whole 80s. We, we loved him. We were so grateful. I go fight Iran for us. He invaded Kuwait. He invaded <laughs> us. <laughs> and he shot missiles into Saudi. He shot missiles into my country, Niskad missiles. And uh, wow. I'm like, what in the world? The world lost all sense of direction for me at that point. Like I didn't know what was, how are a Sunni Muslim country is attacking it's another weird. Sunni Muslim country. I have no grid for that. I don't know how to process that. Like what's, it's called justify it was something else. If it was an outsider, we had that reason to justify like the rest of the stuff that was going on. Yeah. But what are you doing, Saddam? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was crazy. And, uh, and so suddenly we were, stranded my family and i in the u.s mm -hmm. watching from the other side of the planet while this you know gulf war is what they you know called it is going on and i'm like the gulf is my home like this is where i'm from yeah. and i'm watching this and really mixed feelings about this idea of watching american soldiers go mm -hmm. and fight to defend my country these you know infidels <laughs> Yes. are in the Holy Land like they shouldn't be there and they're there and they're fighting and they're the why why is this doesn't make any sense to me like it just seems so wrong all everything about this and you know um I was really disturbed by it and really troubled and I was like why can't why am I stuck here why has God and his sovereignty mm -hmm. placed me here I'm stuck in the middle of the United States I was we were living in the buckle of the Bible belt Right. We didn't. It was so hard to even find another Muslim family to find other people to pray with. There was no mosque anywhere in the city that we were living. 
I eventually was able, you know, as a, as a teenager, connect with, you know, other uh, Muslims, like internationals from, through the university. Mm -hmm. And we would gather together in someone's apartment and we would pray Jum'ah prayer together on Fridays and, and have some fellowship together. Um, but it was just so different. It's so different than the life I was living back home. And I just felt like a foreigner. I felt like a stranger in a strange land. And, you know, after a few years um, and we kind of got to this midway where the war was over and I could have gone back home, but I'm almost to the age that I'd be going to university. I was planning on going to college in the U.S. anyway. That's where the good schools are. Mm -hmm. you know, I'll get my degree, then go back and, and practice my occupation back home. So I thought, well, I'll just go ahead and stay in the U.S. Mm -hmm. But I want to make good use of my time here. And I, I realized how, and, and you know, I, I, any Americans watching this, don't take offense, but how ignorant America is about the rest of the world, how ignorant America is about other people's religions and belief systems. Nobody, and we're talking here now the mid nineties, mid nineties, nobody I met had ever heard of Islam. Wow. Nobody, no, it, nobody would, if you said Muhammad to them, they wouldn't have no idea what that word is. They wouldn't even know it's a name. Yes, yes. And so I thought these poor people that have just, you know, been cursed to grow up in this country of darkness, of ignorance. Yes. And yes. I have the truth, that's what I thought. I have the light and I can bring them the light. I, I know the Quran. I know the teachings of the prophet. I know the way that is Islam. I could teach these people, who knows, maybe some of them, if they have a brain in their head, would understand the truth and become Muslim. So I made it my, my job to <laughs> try to win as many people to Islam as I could. Yep, doing dawah and winning them for Muhammad, right? Yeah, I was a Muslim missionary is how I thought about it. That's right. And, uh, you know, I told my, when I had this idea, I told my father um, and he thought it was great. My uncles back home, they all thought that was a great idea. They started like helping me along. They'd send me like apologetic materials and I would study them and be able to point out, you know, all the problems in the Bible, explain, you know, why the Trinity doesn't make any sense. Like all those wonderful things, right? I, I was really equipped and ready and I would go out and I would, you know, befriend Christians and I would hammer them with this stuff. Um, and I wasn't super polite about it. I wasn't very loving about it. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, a lot of people got turned off by that, um, didn't want to talk to me anymore. Um, some people um, who were professing followers of Jesus were very kind and loving to me, even when I was pretty disrespectful of them and their faith, but they would continue to invite me for dinner. They would continue to love on me. And I thought that was really odd. And I wondered what was different about these people <laughs> that they would treat me this way. And then there were some that were like, I, yeah, I, you know, had some they had a bad experience in church. In this conversation, someone will convert somebody. Right. It's we'll see what's gonna happen. Yeah. And and I and I did. I converted a few people, not tons and tons, but you know, a few people who had some bad experiences in their past, either with someone in a church or with a church group or whatever. You it, you, you eventually find somebody um who who doesn't believe um the gospel and is looking for something else. Yeah. And I gave them that something else and they became Muslim. And then when that started to happen and I started to see, you know, Americans coming and becoming Muslim, I thought, wow, okay, this is great. This is my calling. This is my, you know, <laughs> my, my assignment in life is to do this. Yes. And I did that for several years and uh, eventually <clears throat> uh, met the woman who would become my wife. And she came from a Christian background that didn't bother me at all. Um, I was felt pretty certain I could convince her of the truth and she would leave her religion and become, you know, Muslim. And, um, but just to uh, not rock the boat too much while I was courting her, I, I didn't bring up a lot of those pain points yeah. <laughs> between the religions. I didn't talk too much about what I really thought about Jesus. I would just say that I believe Jesus was a great prophet and, he did many miracles and, and things like that. Uh, never talked about what I thought about the cross or any of those things. Just kept it, you know, polite um, until we got married. And then when we got married is when I said, okay, you know, let's take off the kid gloves now. Yeah. now and talk about what truth That's is. One of the most common ways of converting um, Christians to Islam. Actually, I have um, 
saw some uh, statistics because uh, some of this Muslim um, organization within America take take pride in how many converts they had. Sure. And then when you look at how was those converts, um, mostly is among women mm -hmm. that are married to a Muslim man and they had to convert to marry them. Sure. And those, those uh, they they call them Christians wherever they are, Catholics, okay. whatever. If you're born in America, you're a Christian. That's it. And they and say, I okay, yeah. like I actually believed that mm -hmm. because where I was from, if you're if you're from you know the the king of Saudi Arabia, you're Muslim. Like there's nobody's going to ask you what's your religion. That's it. Like you are. If you're from Iran, nobody's going to ask you what's your religion. Like it's just it's you're, default. by default you're Shia. It's by your, default, your ID card. It's default, on your driver's license. In America. Yeah. Absolutely true. So now you're married, and now it's a it's it's the time to do real apologetics and get this mission accomplished. Right. Finish the job and uh, get my wife rescued from her, you know, backward ways. And yeah. uh, we, what uh, sadly that looked like was a lot of arguments and debates that didn't go anywhere. I was fully convinced of my truth. She was fully convinced of her truth, mm -hmm. and and we couldn't negotiate that. Um, but I, I, I had, I, I was optimistic. I thought, you know, with time, she'll see the problems. It won't work for her and she'll come to Islam. She'll see my example in the home. It will bring her to Islam. Right. And so I was patient. I, I, after a while I stopped pushing and I just thought, I'll wait, I'll wait this out. But then when she became pregnant with our first daughter, mm -hmm. you know, the, then the discussion came, well, what about our children? Oh, wow. If you have a Muslim father and a Christian mother, are the oh, children going to be confused about their religion? And I told my wife, oh, honey, this is not, there's no confusion. It's simple. They're Muslim. Yeah. They're Muslim, like by default. I mean, by Sharia. Yeah. It, From the it, day they're born, born. So, I, they, they, are, they belong to God. They, they are a Muslim. Yeah, wow. And that scared her. And then she knew she was in really in, in trouble. And she had made a, a bad decision. And I want some people to hear me that are, you know, missionary dating Wow, it was a bad decision. And my wife would tell you it was a bad decision to be unequally yoked. And Christians, listen to me. You know what I'm talking about. Like, don't. It's not a game. And it was it was shocking. It was horrifying to her to think that her children were going to be given no choice. Mm -hmm. They were going to be there, have their religion dictated to them. Um, and uh, and and she had chosen this path for herself. Wow. And now what was she going to do? And so she had a real uh, moment of repentance, of asking the Lord's forgiveness um, and pursuing a relationship without his inviting him into the conversation, without inviting his, his taking counsel with him about who she was dating and who she married. As she repented for all of that and asked the Lord to redeem this and, and uh, to rescue me. And uh, she felt the Lord spoke to her really clearly. You can't save Nasser. I'm so glad that you love him. I love him but only I can save him. And so all you can do is pray for him, be a light in your home, be a witness in your home, but but don't try to push him, don't try to argue or fight with him. Pray for him, intercede for him. And and she took that, um, that prayer and that intercession and she mobilized more. She got so many people praying, people at her church, people at other people's churches. She just mobilized an army of of prayer warriors to intercede for me to pray for me i would i would say she was she was like before the situation you know it could happen it could not happen it's gonna be all right yeah but after this now she realizes we really need to get serious about our faith yeah otherwise we lose it all together it's not just for us but for those who come after us for wow. her own children. There's going to be consequences for her own children. Powerful. Wow. Because of her decision. Yeah. She Correct. was too serious. Yeah. And so, yeah, she, she spent two years just raising up so many people to intercede for me and pray for me and pray specifically that God would reveal his truth to me. Wow. Wow. And after that, that <laughs> probably 10 to 20,000 people were praying for me every week. My goodness. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, I'm not proud of that. I think that's a, a testimony to how stubborn I was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to how much prayer was required. You know? took, for me, it took, I think, two, two, two to three people prayed. And in over two hours, I was converted. But yeah. you, man. I was a hard case, brother. <laughs> I was a hard case. I needed all the prayer wow. I could get. And my wife knew it. And she, she mobilized that prayer. 
um, for me. And uh, what happened over those two years, just you know, little by little, um, I became aware of like it's it's weird to talk about it because as a Muslim, like I didn't have any way to uh, categorize what was happening, but but I can look back and see that the Holy Spirit was um, kind of invading my personal space. Mm -hmm. The Lord was wit was near me. He was speaking to me. Um, he was revealing truth to me. I would be having thoughts or I would have just finished up a prayer time. Mm -hmm. And a thought would come into my mind that was not a, an Islamic thought. It's not something I would ever think about, but it would just pop into my mind. And later I would go back and find out when I eventually read the Bible. These were all verses from the Bible. Mm -hmm. that I had never heard before, but they were wow. just being, the spirit was speaking these things into my mind and, and using them to convict me, mm -hmm. to confront me with my own sin, to confront me with the ridiculousness of thinking that my, that any good works I could ever do would ever entitle me to anything yeah. with God yeah. or before God. Um, That's that probably the only the way. biggest deception yeah. even in the body of Christ in the church that you think, okay, I am, Somehow, I'm going to do good in order to earn it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that all the 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 fallacy of that was just being, you know, shoved in my face, so to speak, day after day after day. Um, nobody else seemed to notice this, by the way, from everyone else's perspective who was in my life, including my wife. It just seemed like I was getting harder and harder hearted. I never wanted to talk about religion. I didn't want to discuss you know, anything about the gospel. But internally, I was just, you know, um, working through all these things and, and trying to figure out what this meant That's and why am I having these thoughts and why am I being tormented like this? And I reached the point where, you know, I agreed with with some of this thinking that I thought, you know, you're it's correct. I, I don't deserve to be in paradise. There's nothing I've ever done in my life that makes me uh, makes God obligated to give me anything or do anything for me. Um, whatever punishment I receive on the last day, I deserve it. And, and, you know, God will have to decide, you know, for himself, what he wants to do with me. Mm -hmm. Um, but I became more and more certain that, uh, that I was hopeless and helpless and there was nothing I could do to fix it. I can't pray more. Um, I mean, I tried that. That didn't seem, they, they didn't give me any peace. You know, um, reading the Quran, which used to, I really enjoyed, like, especially during you know, the upcoming here in, in April, the month of Ramadan, I would like read through the Quran as many times as I could. Yeah. I used to really take some pride in that. I enjoyed it. Now, when I read the text, it, it didn't bring me any peace or joy or satisfaction. Um, nothing was fulfilling me spiritually. And I just felt as if that was a sign from God that I was, he was pushing me away. He was saying he didn't want me. And that didn't convince me, by the way, oh, well, Islam's not working. I should find another religion. I never once thought I need to find another religion. I was still convinced Islam was true. I was just becoming also convinced that I was not going to uh, be, be, be forgiven and, and blessed and received into paradise. Mm -hmm. That that just wasn't my destiny. Yeah. The destiny God gave me was, was for the fire, and that was it. And, and I accepted it, I, not happily, but I said, okay, well, that's, what can, you do do? what can you do, right? God is all powerful. You can't question him. You can't do anything. You just accept it. And there's a fatalism. I'm sure you know, brother, in Islam, yeah. that you just, good or bad, you just accept it and you don't try to fight it. You just go with it. And that's where I was um, for two is years. Is that the Gaza you're speaking about? Pardon? The Gaza. Yeah. 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 Everything that is, or mother, you know, like, yeah, I'm predestined, I'm destined for this. There is no me breaking out of this, yeah, exactly. because how could you exactly. over overpower or oversee the power of God or the will of God for your life? It's impossible. Oh, wow, there's not possible, <laughs> it's not possible. You can't do it. And so, there I was. I'm there's no hope for me, there's nothing I can do. I just have to wait mm -hmm. for the my life to end. Like, it was, it was sad, it was depressing. Um, and it was in that that moment, um, that season of my life, where I'd sort of like accepted that that fate, if you will, mm -hmm. that my wife suddenly felt like led by the Lord, like, hey, like, why don't you invite Nasser to come to church with you? Because before then, she never would ask. She, like, she knew what the answer would be. Absolutely not. I will not defile myself 
by walking into your pagan temple. You know? <laughs> uh, but this was the right time and, and the Lord knew it. And so she invited me to come to church and I said, sure, why not? You so know? this process from uh, your first daughter to the, all the prayers, how long did it take that you are kind of in this dilemma, in this um, hopelessness situation that you even... From the very beginning until that point, about two, about two years to where I was just... So it took two years of thousands of people praying. And little by little by little, yeah. Eventually, you are com you are open enough, or you are somehow um, I don't want to use pressured enough, but you're like hopeless enough that you say, okay, even open to going to only to a church, not even accepting Christ, but just opening. Yeah. To and go to, to be honest, the reason why I said yes because I was curious. Wow. I, I just wanted to know what they did in there. <laughs> like I just I was curious about it, and I thought you know what, I'm probably going to hell already. So I might as well find out what I what's what they do. And then I thought a part of me also thought, you know, who knows, maybe I find an open minded person in the church who wants to become Muslim. <laughs> maybe you, know, you always have this like dream, right? Maybe I could convert yeah. the pastor to Islam. Oh, that that maybe, maybe then, you know, God would give me peace and, and I'd feel accepted again by him or, you know, who knows, right? Like what, what could happen? On the media too. Oh, the right. path oh. to Islam? Yeah, I would have loved it. I would have loved that. Wow. And so, yeah, so I went in and I was like, okay, let's just see what this is. Let's see what this is about. Mm -hmm. I've put, you know, at this point, I'd been in the US about six years. So I'd met a lot of Christians. I'd heard a lot about their church gatherings and all of that, but I really hadn't experienced like an American Christian church service. So I went in and uh, of course, Almost everything. I say, this is a really big church, by the way, like several thousand members. Um, and uh, I was just blown away at how awful everything seemed to be to me. <laughs> like, I just thought it was all satanic. I really did. Because, you know, uh, you know, coming from a Muslim background, you know, things that we are are expecting you know we what what can we compare it to going in blind right i would compare i would compare it to going to the masjids going to mosque right oh, it's absolutely. A experience. It's equivalent absolutely yeah. be you go in clean you're washed mm -hmm. you take you know your shoes you know on bare feet your shoes have been removed you're yeah. going in in this holy atmosphere of i'm going to worship god i'm going to you know do my duty and pay my respects and you put yeah, some i'm not going to play games yeah, I'm not there to be entertained, right? I'm not there to have fellowship. I'm there to pray. Um, and I walk into the church and, you know, they have this big, you know, sign over this one section. The big room says the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. But they walk in with their shoes on into the sanctuary. Yeah. Nobody's washing before they go in. Yeah. People have coffee and donuts in the sanctuary. <laughs> like, people are shaking hands and hugging each other. There's no separation between men and women. Wow. And then to bring it all to, you know, to order, like some, a rock band comes on the stage and they begin playing music. And so I'm just like, haram, 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 like everything. Everything yeah. about this place is haram. Yes. And I'm like, no wonder these people are going to hell is what I thought. Like they just are so wrong about everything that they do. But I sat through the service and, and despite having all of that kind of repulsion to the practices that I was seeing, there was something there in, in that room that drew me. I felt I felt I, I, that I wanted to be a part of, and I didn't understand why I was being attracted. Mm -hmm. And so as I, I, I told my wife afterwards, you know, I thought this was the most satanic thing I've ever seen, but I want to go back next week. <laughs> I want to <laughs> check it out again, because I want to investigate more. I want to, like a scientist, like my academic background is in, you know, computer science. So I, I want to investigate, I want to test. You know, I want to learn more and I want to know why do I still feel drawn to this if in my mind I know everything about this is wrong. That's right. And so week after week, I'm just kind of paying attention. I'm sitting in the very back of the church, but I'm watching everything. I'm watching what people are doing. I'm watching how they're talking to one another, how they're treating. I'm looking at the, the looks that they give to one another, mm -hmm. the tone that they use when they talk about certain things and paying attention. I realize some crazy things that these Christians believe. Number one. Even though this was a real large church, it was very, very diverse. People from all sorts of backgrounds, economic backgrounds, racial backgrounds, uh, family backgrounds, whatever. They, they believe that they are all one family. That's crazy. Like they really believe that. Like not just talk. 
Like we talk in Islam about the ummah. Like, no, they really believe it. Number two, crazier than that, yeah. they think that God loves them so much that if they stop everything and sing a song to him, he's listening. Wow. He's in the room with them. He's paying attention. They think the God of the universe cares so much about them that he's literally like his presence is in the room with them as they sing to him and worship him. And I thought, how audacious, like how crazy is that? You really think you matter that much to God as a human yeah. being. Yeah. And, and he thought, and he has to leave all of that glory and majesty and all running this universe after universe just to come and listen to your terrible singing. Yeah, exactly. And it wasn't that great sometimes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. It wasn't award winning music going on in the room. And yet they, they could see the passion. People crying as they worship because they they felt as if God was there with them. Yeah. And I thought, crazy. That's crazy. You're all crazy. But, oh, I wish that was true. Wouldn't that be amazing if that was true? Yeah. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could be one family, if we could be in God's holy presence, not after we die in Jannah someday, but like right now to be in the presence of God, to be able to experience his presence, to be able to hear his voice to know him wow that would be amazing but there's just no way like i could think of all these reasons why no way we're too fallen we're too dirty we're too this he's too that he's too transcendent he's right. too holy he's too righteous right pure God of islam is a distant god i mean you so, not approach so god yeah it's whatever you you name the practices in varieties of islam branches from Sufism to Zen to dancing to meditation to self-sacrificing uh, to self-beating, self-flagellations, all of the prayers and fasting. Brother, you name it. Yeah. I, I wanted to get close. Yeah. I know you as a Muslim. You try your best because all of that washing and cle cle cleansing of yourself and cleaning yourself and doing the wuzu and all of it. Yeah. Man, can I feel a little bit of yeah. distance that is I'm getting a little worthy, getting a little closer. It's just like the more you try, it's like the, the, the two uh, minus sign of the magnet, you yeah. push it and then they just get further and further. Right. Just the force just, gets stronger as it gets closer. The repulsive force gets stronger. It, yeah. And you try more. It's like, why is it running away from me? Why is it never satisfied with me? Yeah. I cannot earn his pleasure. That's what's, all of my life for 23 years, brother. Yeah. So I just get under. I sympathize. That's exactly where I was too. So there I was, mm -hmm. um, you know, after several weeks, you know, sitting in the back of this church, thinking to myself, oh, I, how I wish, how I wish this gospel was true. Yeah. You know, 20, 20 year old Muslim, married, father of a little baby girl, and so hopeless, feeling so distant from God wanting to have what these people had but i wasn't willing to believe a lie just so that i could feel better correct mm -hmm. and so i thought you know the only one that can prove to me if the gospel is true is god that's it i'm not going to believe it just because some christian person with a smile on their face tells me it's true i need to know for certain if i'm going to leave islam for anything like i'm not going to leave I have to go to truth. I have to go to what's true, whether I like it or not. Whether the truth is convenient for me or not, I want to know what the truth is so that I can believe. And I and I still at that moment was probably like 95% sure that Islam was true. But I had just enough of a like a crack to say, to be open enough to say, God, if there's another truth, if there's a real truth that I need to believe, then show me. I want to know. You know, if I'm on the right path, then so be it. But if I'm on the wrong path, then show me what I need to know so that I can have what these people have. Yeah. And when I prayed that, when I asked that to God, and I wasn't someone who normally, uh, you know, I had conversations with God, even in my mind. You know, I served him. I prayed to him. I did things for him, but I didn't have a relationship with him. Okay. But in that moment, I just reached out in my heart. You know, God, if you're listening, if you know the contents of my heart right now, show me, show me what the truth is. And as soon as I had that thought, 
I have this vision. And uh, I, it was as if I was just plucked from that church, plucked from where I was. And now I'm just standing here on this rocky hill watching this man in front of me being nailed to a cross. And then that cross being raised up and looking up into the face of this um, bloodied, beaten man with such deep love in his eyes, deep understanding, knowing in his eyes, looking at me, loving me even as he's in pain up on that cross and realizing that this is more than just a prophet. This is more than just a miracle worker. This is the one who knows me inside and out, who loves me more than anyone could ever love me. And, and somehow what's happening to him on that cross in that moment is for me. And it's because of his love for me. And, you know, this vision went on for what felt like hours. And, you know, it was spooky to me to go back later and, and read the gospel accounts and see the things that the Lord was showing me in that vision. He was just showing me the gospel. So he was you, showing me the truth. You did the prayer inside that church, correct? Yeah. yeah. And then boom, you were translated to this yeah. vision. Yeah. And it's such an amazing because I had an encounter with God, very similar the first time I visited the church. And it's like time does not exist yes. anymore. You're just sucked into this vacuum yeah. yeah you're so fascinated by him and his glory and and the things that he's just opening your eyes to see that then the the basic needs that everyone on the planet earth runs after him such as food and food and water and shelter and oxygen and yeah. any it doesn't exist in his presence mm -hmm. and you're sucked into that and it it that I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes in our dimension. Yeah. It's like years that you have spent it with them. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Absolutely that's amazing. exactly what I experienced, brother. That same you, thing. You saw that. You saw that valley. You saw the crucifixion. Yeah. You saw the Lord upon that crucifixion. Yeah. It's taking it for you. Mm -hmm. And then now you're going to read the New Testament account. Is that how? What's so, what account? happened was by the end of that vision, there wasn't like words exchanged. It wasn't like the Lord spoke to me directly. Like I, I watched, it's all visual. I'm just watching it all like a movie. Mm -hmm. But it's somehow like my mind, in my mind, I'm con finally connecting the dots. I'm finally understanding why Jesus, why the cross? Mm -hmm. and, and what has this now accomplished in his death and in his resurrection? What has been accomplished for me? What I finally understood what it was that God was asking me to believe and that he had taken the penalty for my sin mm -hmm. and given me in its place, right relationship with him, mm -hmm. restoration, freedom, freedom from the things that had enslaved me my whole life. He was offering me freedom paid for with his own blood. Wow. And that, that was the decision now that I had to make. And so as soon as the vision ended, miraculously, right at that point, like I had missed, I had this vision while the pastor was preaching his sermon. So I, I missed his whole sermon, didn't hear his sermon. I'm sure it was great. I missed the, the closing song, all of those things. But I, I had just kind of come back to myself right as they were about to close the service. And the pastor asked everyone, hey, if there's anyone here right now who would like to receive the Lord Jesus as their Lord and Savior, everyone would just bow their heads Close your eyes just for a moment. And if you want to receive Jesus right now, just pray the simple prayer after me. Yep. And he did this every week almost. And I'd seen it before. I thought it was stupid. Mm -hmm. Oh, you think you're going to pray a little magic prayer and everything will be great for you. That's so silly, right? I thought it was so silly. But here I was, tears coming down my eyes. And I'm praying this prayer and asking the Lord to forgive me of my sin. Ask confessing Jesus as my Lord and as my Savior and as my God. And immediately after I did that, immediately brother i felt something like a warm blanket just come and just wrap me up in the most wonderful peace like my heart 
all the burdens that I've been carrying just like melting away. I felt the love of God, not from a distance, not even like close, but like inside me, like under my skin. It was amazing. Praise it was amazing. And my heart is just exploding with like, yes, this, this is like what I've longed for my whole life. And then immediately my Muslim brain kicks in as like, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, what are you saying? Why did you pray this prayer? Like you're like, an, like this is shirk, like what are you doing? You're praying to Jesus, like all of these things. And I was torn in that moment between my mind and the what I was trained yes, and my heart and what I was experiencing, what I was actually feeling in that moment. And it spent a whole week, I didn't say a word to anyone about the vision, what I had prayed, nothing. Just trying to figure out what was that? What happened to me? I don't know if you did the same with when you had your experience, but I thought, did I go crazy? Did I lose my mind? Was that real? Who am I that God would speak to me? Why? I'm no one. You're just torn in between. I mean, the crisis, it's real. Yeah. Everything that you have grown up, everything that you have been trained, everything that they have brainwashed you, whatever you want to put that term, your whole identity, everything that belongs to you, you you face it in that moment. Should I put it down or should I reject everything that I experienced with Christ or that moment of that prayer? Yeah. But I, when I did the prayer and then, you know, it's amazing that burden when it's gone. It's like, I don't know. It felt like 250 pounds, 300 pounds weight on my shoulder at all time. Yeah. I could not just, what is this? What? And then I do a simple prayer, repent of my sin, accept the Lord as my Lord and my Savior. And then that's gone. Mm -hmm. And I'm walking home and I'm thinking, how about my parents? Yeah. How about my neighbors? How about the Moscow neighborhood? If they do the same thing, this is going to happen to him? Or am I being kind of somehow delusional? Right. Sure. And and that's that's the crisis mm -hmm. that really somebody needs to walk you and help you to get over it. Or or you easily, mm -hmm. the, the, those deceptions that they have been trained in, yeah. it will take you away. I yeah. mean, it, it will kill you, kill your faith if that moment of, Crisis is not dealt with. And then you yes. say, I'm going to just put it off. And then I'm right. going to believe in Jesus because I had this experience. Because you, your mind is just reasoning with you that you it was not a vision. You just right. were you know, delusional and yeah. this lie and everything is like that. So tell us. Please tell us what happened. This right. is so, wow. you know, I'm, I'm a scientist, so I wanted to test the experience. Right? Mm -hmm. I thought, um, in my mind, there were only three options for the vision. Number one, um, hallucination, I was daydreaming, whatever. It was a vivid dream, I fell asleep, whatever. Um, number two, vision was real, but it was from Satan. Yeah. Satan gave me a supernatural experience to lead me away from my faith. Yeah. Or and number three. A common thing in Islam. Oh, yeah, totally, totally. Or number three, God actually, I, I called out to God, I did, I knew that, mm -hmm. and God actually answered me. Wow. Those are the only three options. So I went after a week. I sort of did a self-diagnostic. Is How am I doing? Is the burden back? No. Do I still feel the peace with God? Yes. Do I still feel the presence and the love of God with me? Yes. If, if anything, it's just growing now in me. And I thought, well, that doesn't. I've had a lot of dreams in my life, like, you know, silly dreams, daydreams, whatever. None of them has ever affected me in a physical way a week later. But I'm still feeling the effects of it. I don't, I don't think uh, Satan can give me, can put peace in my heart, can make me love my wife more than I've ever loved her before, mm -hmm. love my daughter more than I've ever loved. I don't think Satan can. I don't think those are gifts he can give. So that means the only option, if whether I like it or not, <laughs> and I didn't like it very much. I'm being honest with you. I didn't like that. This was the, this was the answer, the conclusion was that God actually answered me and he spoke to me and he showed me a truth I didn't want to believe. But if it's the truth, I, what else, what other choice do I have? That's it. Yeah. So now my dilemma is what do I do with this information? Do I keep it to myself and stay safe? Or do I speak it out and risk 
yeah. not just what might happen to me, yeah. but what will happen to my brothers, my sisters? Yes. What will happen to my mother? What will happen to my father? What will happen to my family back home? Yeah. And the That's way we good. think and the way we are wired to think. Yeah. It's all about people, about our community, about our ummah, about our family, relatives. We just don't think, okay, what's going to happen to me? Individualism, it doesn't exist in a Muslim yeah, culture. Yeah. I it's was thinking this is going to hurt my family so bad. This may even destroy my family. Wow. And and what do I do with that? That's and, right. Uh, you know, again, um, grace of God, mm -hmm. he took the decision out of my hands. Mm -hmm. and that, um, you know, I knew I had to tell, if I told no one else, I needed to tell my wife who's praying for me, sometimes weeping into her pillow every night, praying for my salvation, praying for God to speak to me. And so how can I keep silent when God has answered her prayer? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I just could have seen that throughout. Yeah, I had seen it. Yeah. And so I told her and she didn't really know yet. Like we were only been married a couple of years. So she didn't know our culture very well. Uh, she didn't quite understand how things work. She didn't understand the dangers. Um, and so she, without thinking about it, immediately called the church to tell them about my decision for Christ. She told her family, she told you know, all these people, you know, some of our friends, she yeah. was excited, like rightfully excited about it. But I was like, Oh no, what have you done? Oh, no. I'm, I'm sure. was like, Whew, man, we got this one figured out. This yeah. One to the next one right right so i i felt like at that point i couldn't keep quiet i wasn't gonna I either now i was gonna have to deny christ if one of my family members said hey we heard a rumor about you is it true and i knew i couldn't do that after what i'd seen what he'd gone through for me on the cross yes. i can't deny him mm -hmm. so that means i've got to i've got to tell the truth what happened whether they think i'm insane whether they think i'm a traitor whatever they think i have to speak the truth and, and I, I need to be the one to come to them. I don't want to be a coward and wait for them to come to me. So I went and and because I still was a little cowardly, I started with my youngest sister. Wow. And I confess, she was the first person in my family that I confessed to wow. that I had uh, become a follower of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And she heard the news. She listened to everything that I had you know, shared with you, you know, over the last 40 minutes. And her eyes got really wide. She couldn't believe what she was hearing. But at the end of the, the discussion, she asked, if she could also follow Jesus, if she had my permission as her big brother, I give her permission to also become a follower of Jesus. Awesome. And so she we pray with her. You have gone through, and then she's like, wow. And then she's asking you, yeah. you I, do I have the permission to follow Christ? Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. The truth was, Muhammad was my sister had already been exposed to the gospel. We'd been in the U.S., like I said, six years at this point. She'd also been exposed to the gospel. She wasn't nearly as like devout and like hardcore Salafi Muslim guy like I was. Mm -hmm. And and she was hearing things in the gospel that attracted her. But she was afraid mm -hmm. to make a decision for Christ because of me. She was afraid what I would do to her. Yes. And when I realized that I was the stumbling block, I was the reason, I was what was keeping her from the kingdom of God. I thought, oh boy, who else in my life am I the obstacle? And now I, I just get motivated me. It, like it put a fire in me. I've got to tell every member of my family whatever happens. So I went and shared with my brother Ibrahim. We spent a long afternoon talking, debating things. He had a lot of questions. Um, but by the end of the day, like after, after an afternoon of discussion, he said, you know, uh, what, I believe what you're saying to me and I trust you. And I know you wouldn't make this up. You wouldn't lie to me. I want to follow Jesus. And we prayed with him. Wow. Yeah. So I got two of my one brother, one sister, one brother. So I'm thinking, this is easy. Wow. Is Abraham, I save everyone now. <laughs> is Abraham older or younger? I'm the oldest. Oh, so they were like, okay, my goodness. If you know, they looked up to this radical one that is, yeah. Stopping everybody from making any sort of decisions. Yeah. Now that's gone. Right. I'm like, okay, let's get this done. Like, if wow. this is how it is, like, oh, what was I worried about? But then my next brother I shared with, he just totally, you know, rejected everything I was saying, didn't want to hear it, didn't want to listen to me, um, became very angry, upset, insulted, offended. 
Um, and, you know, I kept trying and trying to explain things to him. And eventually he said, you know, if as long as you keep talking about Jesus in this way, I don't want to hear anything else from you ever again. You're not my brother. Well, I don't want no relationship with you. And I was just like, oh, it was so painful. And um, eventually, you know, I had to work my way up. And I eventually the last person I told was my father. Um, yeah, and, that, that you know, chain of command. Yeah, I went up the chain of command and uh, I got to my father and he was so upset, obviously. Obviously. I mean, I knew he would be hurt, angry, betrayed. And, uh, you know, he told me that he'd keep this like a secret from our family back home. Yes. For a short time, he said, I'm going to give you some time to repent, to come to your senses, realize that this decision you've made is the wrong one. And if you come back to Islam, we'll just pretend like this never happened. We won't discuss it again. It'll yeah. be erased, right? Typical Muslim family, how we handle all these things. Yes. Um, but obviously I didn't, you know, one year passed, two years passed. I'm only growing in my faith. I'm becoming bolder and sharing with him, sharing with others. And he eventually said to me that, you know, I wasn't his son and I was dead to him and uh, that I would not be welcome home and that I should stay in America because, it, you know, bad things would happen to me if I came home. Um, that was so hard. Um, but that's not, as you know, brother, it's sadly so typical. Yep. Unfortunately, I've gone through it, brother. I just know there is a price to pay. Yeah. It's the cross. The being, being a follower, being a disciple, it will cost you everything. Yeah, it's just not like, man. Especially from from a Muslim background, I mean, I had rare occasions of brothers and sisters I know from Muslim background that the whole family has converted. Yes, and it's like the key is in the hand of the father. When when he converts, it's just like the older brother for the for the uh, siblings, the father in the family when they first convert or they become Christians, it's for the rest of the family. Yeah. But when it's in other orders, it's a very difficult situation. Yes. Yes, it is. All sort of, um, I, I always said that they, my family, they did not physically kill me. Mm -hmm. They weren't cruel, cruel, some yeah. kind of uh, psychopath people that they will kill their son. Yeah. But they helped socially to kill me. And that was cutting me from relatives and friends. And uh, it happens in Muslim world, especially yeah. when you are there and not in America. Yeah. And um, it's things run, uh, things run very different. Yes. Than here. And this is the cost that between truth and my family. And, and he has, he has given us his words in the scriptures because I was, I was always shocked why would he say, he say, he calls himself the Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. At the same time, he calls him, I didn't come to bring peace. Yeah, Matthew chapter 10. Yeah, and then put a man against his father and so on and so forth. It's just like amazing. He anticipated this will happen. Yes. Gospel will separate us. Yes. Wow. So he says, don't come back home. Yeah. And if you come back home, things can go really wrong, especially in Saudi and you're like, my goodness, I'm not my dad's son anymore. Right. I've lost because my father. To one of the most important relationships in my life. Yeah. And, and I betrayed him. He is feel, he's he feels like he's betrayed by me. Yeah. And now what, brother? What happened? Yeah. Well, I I continued on that journey of uh learning what this what this decision really meant, right? Because we are how we come to Christ is not the end of the story. It's the beginning. It's the door. The story. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, I came to know the Lord in, in 1996. So it's now been 25 years of following Jesus. And in that time, I've since seen my mother come to know the Lord. That's um, I, I have um, other family members that I think are actually very close. My relationship with my father is slowly being restored. Um, we're sp on speaking terms again. He's becoming more and more loving to me. And, and guess what? We're asking people to pray for him. That's it. Um, to pray for my brother brothers and to pray for my unsafe sisters. And uh, the prayers work for you. It worked for him. Yes. Yes. And and I can say 
um, without hesitation that, that the suffering that, that I've experienced um, for my decision to follow Jesus was absolutely worth it. Absolutely. And I would pay it a hundred times over. He is, the Lord is so good. He has never left me or left my family. Um, he's never abandoned us. Um, his love endures forever. Amen. That's beautiful. Many times, brother, when I share, the first question I get is, um, this this price was too much. Mm-hmm. How's your relationship with your family? How's, you know, um, th- th- some of the Christians actually feel heartbroken for me. Sure. I'm like, this is the best thing I've ever done. Yeah. There is no looking back in this. There is no, th- there is not much of a price in my part that I can give yeah. to earn what he has done. Yes. It is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. The best decision I've, I have always told people, the first best decision you will make in life, if there is any man's involvement in it, because that's another argument, because mm-hmm. God is absolutely providentially is moving things. Yes. To help you to make that decision eventually. Mm-hmm. But he is in it because the Bible says not by works that any man can boast, but it's by grace through faith. And that's, he says, both. it's a gift of God. Yeah. Both, both sides are the, the grace that provides all of this sacrificial yeah. forgiveness. It's God's gift. And yeah. the faith that you put in him is also a gift. It's yeah. amazing. But there is a decision that we, I, I don't, at, at the same time, I don't believe that it's like, us separated from God or God separated from us. Mm-hmm. He loves his relationship. This, yes. this, this close, intimate. It's a family. Absolutely. Father, son, husband, wife, bride and groom. These are the descriptions in the Bible. He yeah. loves this relationship and he works with you. He's patient, the Bible says. Yes. yes. All come to the knowledge of Christ. And, um, I believe he's patient with your father, with your, with the rest of the family or the people that you're longing to see them coming to Christ. He knows my heart. I've been praying for my mom. It's been 13 years, brother. Mm. When I talked to her about the Lord, she would she would hold her ears and mm. scream, just, yeah. just refuse to hear what I have to say. Right. But I know if God can change my heart, if I if God can change Nasser. There is no difficult case for him. Exactly. I'm like, oh man, the the heaven's light is gonna dim out. <laughs> the power went out. You know, it's like, oh, brother Nasser, oh, you're there, man. It's this is the, the he's gonna look down. His his precious blood. Yes. He has paid it all. The Bible says he died for the sin of the world, Amen. not for me or yours, for for your father. It's just that moment of we need to really really believe God for him that his love is great and greater than ours for or even for our family members much greater and that's so true brother and that's one of a truth that the Lord has used to encourage me so much when I think about you know unsaved family members that I have is you know, as I'm praying for them you know God always says to me you know I love them even more than you do mm-hmm. I want them to know me even more than you do absolutely agreed his love is greater his power is greater. And then, brother, I was I was thinking like my mom, you know, in my doubtful mind, I, my mom is going to be a difficult case for God. And the Lord reminded me, you are glorifying him mm-hmm. instead of glorifying me. Yeah. That whole changed the perspective of how I pray f- for, for her. Mm-hmm. Because I was like, mom, Lord, Lord, please, Lord, do. And it's like, I was just like making it. It's like God doesn't know the situation or something. <laughs> yeah. Like. I needed to tell him, yeah. God, you need to take this serious. Mm-hmm. And then he just reminded me the whole approach was wrong. Yes. That you glorify me and see how I just take care of the business. That's right. There's a question in the comments. It's been okay. about an hour, brother, that we're yeah. talking. It's a powerful testimony. I've been blessed. I believe with all of my heart. Many of our viewers that are watching now or they will watch later, they will be blessed by it and encouraged. And uh, there is a question in the comments. I uh, told one of the uh, viewers that is, I believe, is a Muslim. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. the, ways, the way uh, he or she is asking, um, that I would like to address because I said I will address this when uh, we get the right time coming. And uh, the question is, it's from uh, trustworthy. I don't know, um, is anything about Islam trustworthy? Because when you don't know where you go, what trustworthiness is, is that? But uh, he is asking right here, brother. So let me put it on the screen. Did this Muslim not read the Quran? Is that is telling you this, um, brother Nasser, did not read the Quran that Allah accepts the repentance and forgiving sins? Sure. Does not know that Allah is all forgiving. Totally. Totally. It was all up here. Totally. Mm-hmm. And guess what? Still felt the weight. Yep. Still felt the burden in my heart. Still felt no peace. So what do you do? What do you do? And I'm I'm not trying to make fun of this person. Like, if, if that's what they believe, guess what? I believe that too. And I I, but but w- let's let's move beyond idea, abstract ideas, mm-hmm. and and verses from a book. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about real life, real human beings. Mm-hmm. What do you do with that statement mm-hmm. when it doesn't work? What does Islam tell you to go from there? Well, it just tells you, go read it again and believe it. Keep reading it. Keep reading it. Well, I did that. So where where, where do we go from there? Yeah, exactly. And for me as a Muslim, I had nowhere else to go. I can't go anywhere beyond the Quran. The Quran is as high as it gets. That's it. As in my life. And so if I read a verse like that and I'm trying to apply it to my life and it's not working for me, what do I do? I'm hopeless. I'm helpless. And in that case, and this is one of the crazy things that one of the ways God spoke to me, I mentioned how he was speaking to me by by literally speaking verses from the Bible into my mind to to help guide me and and, and start showing me um, his truth. But he was also using uh, my wife would listen to like Christian music. And I'd always like try to make her turn it off and I didn't want to hear it. You know, I'd, I'd almost be like your mother, like, oh, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to be infected by this. Right. But certain lyrics would get stuck in my head. And at, at the worst times, like when I would be struggling with a verse like that, you know what lyric would come into my mind from DC talk in the light? You're still a man in need of a savior. That's it. I'm still a man in need of a savior. And I would think as a, as a Muslim, a stuff for Allah, I don't believe that. I don't need a savior. I need to do, I need to do this. I need to re- be, be uh, bow before God in true repentance and, and, and just do my duty, follow all the rules that I've been given and everything will be okay. And I resisted it, and I resisted it, and I resisted it. And um, since since uh, he has quoted the Quran that uh, Allah is all forgiving, I'm quoting the Quran back, brother. I put it on the screen because I want everybody knows. And that's Surah uh, chapter 19, verse 71 and verse 72. That's literal translation. There will be no one of you who will not enter it, enter it talking about hell. Mm-hmm. This is the promises of the Quran. But when I read it, it was frightening. But what's the way out of this? When my God says, all of you will enter there first. And yeah. then from within, I will choose somebody out. Yeah. Yes, he is all forgiving and all this and all that. But there are other passages, there are other scriptures within the Quran yeah. that totally goes against him being all forgiving. And if he is all forgiving, meaning... That I'm gonna somehow wipe off your sin. The sin's just gonna go away by itself. Because if you show up in front of a judge and you tell him, Well, I killed this person, but I have pay my zakat. <laughs> you know how right. and the judge is gonna say, What does this sin has to do with your good works? Yeah, you have committed this sin, you have lied and cheated, and you have uh, stolen. I mean, yeah. if you put the Ten Commandments from, my goodness, all Ten Commandments, we have broken it. Mm-hmm. All of the Sharia, you have broken it. And now you tell me you have paid zakat and went to the Mecca to, pilg- to do your pil- pilgrimage. And you, I don't know, helps an old, what does that has to do? And where is the justice of God? And if he doesn't punish your sin. Mm. And the Bible clearly tells us the wages of sin is death. But it doesn't stop. Unfortunately for Islam, it stops there. We know that we have sin and we will burn up, burn in hell. But the Bible, t- Jesus tells us, 
but the gift of God is the forgiveness that we receive through Christ. That's the beautiful part that it doesn't stop. That we know the wages. We all felt the weight as Muslims. Yeah. But there is a gift that there is a price that Christ has paid for us. So that's one of the key verses that I always um, tell Muslims that have you read this one that you will end up in hell. This is no matter what it's in the Quran. You cannot say it's not in a Hadith or it's a Shia source or Sunni source or somehow you discredit this. This is in your one source that everybody agrees. Chapter 19, verse 71 and 72. So I don't, I, I don't know what would be the answer to that, but I know as a Muslim, I live the Muslim life. It is so uncertain that, it, that you will do anything to make it certain. And the death is the only way to, to be a slain and to do, commit jihad and become a martyr. That was the only guarantee. That's what I could find. If, if brother, you found something else, you let me <laughs> convert back to Islam. Yeah. So um, we heard the testimony. We heard that now you're a believer for 25 years. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage everybody because I have put your um, YouTube channel in the links. Please go, go there and subscribe to it because that's a very important uh, part to supporting uh, my brother Nasser's work. And where else do they need to go, brother? If somebody wants to get a hold of you, if, if – um, there's a pastor that is watching this, a church yeah. that is. How can they get a hold of you? How can they connect with you? Other than uh, sure, um, yeah, the, the, uh, on the YouTube channel, actually, if you go to the uh, about page, mm -hmm. uh, I have my email there. You're free to connect with me through uh, my email address, Nasser at disciplenations.net. Nasser at disciplenations.net. Yeah, wonderful. And that's how I got a hold of you, actually, it's because your proof, I your proof <laughs> that if you send an email there, eventually I will see it. Yes, it is possible. So, brothers and sisters, I encourage you. It is possible. Later, <laughs> soon or late, he will respond. That's yeah, why we're sitting here. a little bit. So, you know, be patient with me if, uh, if I don't respond right away. And uh, one of the other questions, do you have any biographies? Just, just another question from I say to myself. Do you, do you, have you have you written? Have you have you? Uh, you know, I I've had people telling me I need because there's so much actually more to the story that I didn't share just for time's sake. I can um, imagine. I've had people encouraging me to write the story of of my journey to Christ and since my journey since finding Him, um, and maybe one day when I have time. <laughs> there's a lot of things I want to write, uh, but in 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 my priority list of things I want to write. I want to I want to see better discipleship materials for believers that are coming from a Muslim background. There's, there's a lot of of things that I, I would love to write, um, and my my personal biography is towards the bottom of that list as far as my priority list. But the Lord has full freedom to rearrange my priorities and and put things where they need to be. I would I would highly encourage you to write it, brother, because um, testimonies you cannot argue with them. And the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, we overcome with the Amen. blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony. It's a powerful, powerful tools. I have many, many times when I shared it with Muslims, when I'm evangelizing other Muslims, I mean, it's not even evangel. I'm inviting them to a kingdom, yeah, to a better place that they can overcome yeah. the situations that they cannot overcome in their lives on their own effort. There is a higher power. There is a God that wants to reach out to them, but you need to accept that path yeah. that he has chosen, not the path that we offer to him. Right. That's, that's the amazing thing about the gospel. Yeah. The God has already revealed this path to us. He has already extended the help toward us, but would you take it? Yeah. As a Muslim, so that's how I inter introduced them to the kingdom of God. Oh yeah, and uh, they, you know, uh, in Iran, we tell if you're a Christian, you're Armenian, you're yeah. a Swiss, you're not Iranian. You Iranians are not uh, Christians. But when I tell them, they're like, "Are you Armenian?" And I tell, "No, my name is Muhammad." Yeah, they are like, "No, <laughs> Akbar, yani, yeah. me, like what?" Yeah. Christian Muhammad, you know, it's a contradict in their mind. Oh, yeah. Be even I, worse, probably, if your name was Ali. 
<laughs> <laughs> my name is Muhammad Amin. It's like, oh gosh, I have his title. I have his prophet. I mean, it's just like the least um, person to be converted to Christianity. Anyway, so I would really want to, I know a lot of people want to read that work that you will do and your testimony. I would be phenomenal. Absolutely. I would, I would buy the book. Okay. Well, now I would pay for it, but I would I would oh, say it's gonna be powerful because um, it's it's a powerful tool, it really is. I have a really really um, important question because okay. about Iran and about Persia, we know that a lot of missionaries and a lot of ministries they say, okay, Iranians are now very open to the gospel. They could actually some of the uh, like. Um, Operation World Mission Organizations, things of that nature, actually put him on number one mm -hmm. church anywhere in that's the world. The church in the world. So, so th that's that's about our country. I I know it because I'm on a daily basis. I'm working with Iranian. I'm a pastor in Iranian church, yeah. Persian church, here and in Europe online and so on and so forth. So I know about Iran. I can explain it. I don't know what is going on in Saudi. Mm -hmm. I don't know how's the situation there. Would you would you tell us? What is going on politically, economically, sure. and um, how open people are to the gospel? Yeah. What's the disciple making movement and things of that nature? That if you share in that regard, I would really appreciate. Yeah, I want to be really careful here uh, mm -hmm. because I, I I pay attention very much to what's going on in my country and what the Lord is doing and things that are happening politically. Uh, there's been a lot, I'll just say that there's been a lot of political changes mm -hmm. in Saudi Arabia over the last few years. And anybody who's been watching the news is aware of those, those changes. Um, some people in the country are very excited about the changes. Some people are against the changes. Um, and it's, it's a, a time of transition and transition is hard and painful. And that's what the country is experiencing. I'm very hopeful overall that the freedoms that are the, the the legal freedoms that are coming to the country first for women um and, and then for other groups and there's talk now uh, and i think they're serious about allowing um churches to be built in saudi arabia before you get too excited for expats for foreigners right not for saudis but for oh, foreigners. Yeah. Right? Yes. but that would be amazing as a start to see that happen. And I, I would not be surprised if that happens over the next um, two or three years, if we see that um, happen. I can tell you that um, among the the population of, of people in Saudi Arabia, the, the younger generation um, has primarily been educated outside the country. Yeah. So they've been exposed yeah. to life outside, you know, the Ummah and, you know, the Islamic utopia that they've we're told they grew up in and they see how the rest of the world works and they see the things that are broken in their own society and culture that other nations, this, these things aren't a problem. Yes. They're not even Muslims and they've got these things figured out. And, and so they're much more open to new ideas. They're they're A lot of them are more open to um, thinking through the things that they believe and why they believe. Sadly, I think there was a poll that was done among youth and just, I'm just talking about the Khalij now. So this isn't just Saudi. This is, UAE, Qatar, Bahrain, Kuwait, all, that's all those countries. Um, a lot more of the youth are trending towards agnosticism. So they'll, if you ask them, they'll say they're a Muslim because they want to keep mom and dad happy. But if you're there, if you develop a close relationship with them and you get them to open up about what they really believe, they'll tell you, I don't know. I don't know if any of this is true. I don't know if any of this matters. Um, I just want to live my life, raise my family, make as much money as I can, have a good life. And then when I die, I die. Who knows what will happen? That's the majority of younger people, uh, especially the millennial generation there. Um, and these people, I mean, I totally get what, how they would find themselves on that road with their experiences and what they've seen outside the country, what they see inside the country. But to me, that's also exciting because I think that's, that's a fertile field. Those are people that are open to uh, thinking outside the box that was built for them mm -hmm. and open to have rational conversations about truth, about um, what we believe about who God is, mm -hmm. 
who we are as his creation, what we were made for, all of that. So it's overall, I'd say I've really, really positive outlook on where things are going. And, you know, in private, I could tell you a lot more. Yes. Yes. Really that's amazing exciting. things that are happening, but yes. obviously. Yeah. That's, that's exciting. Great, Scott. I, I mean, you know, even for, for an Iranian, it was always hard to believe that, for example, women in Saudi cannot drive. I mean, we could not like, Look, it's for their ovaries, brother. We have to protect their ovaries. Yes. And I'm serious. That was the that was the reason. My goodness, it's unbelievable. You know, even it's not like we're in an open country. Iran is not an open country, no. but even relatively, if you put it in perspective, you're like, what? I mean, the Iranian women, if you have any contact with them or any understanding they'll kill you if you for example tell them something They're like oh gosh even in that islam islamic mentality yeah they're pretty much there but when we thought about saudi we're like is this real i mean or is it just for news how cannot for example you can totally eliminate mm -hmm. the woman out of driving and voting and this and that it's, but when i hear these days that things are changing and shifting even yeah. in saudi I'm excited. Me too. I believe with all of my heart, brother, with all the stuff that is happening, even even through COVID. Yes. And the Mecca and the uh, city of Qom, city of uh, all of the Islamic centers yeah. are closed, shut off. Yeah. It just shows how powerless this whole thing is. Yeah. Facade. How can easily just go out of business like overnight? Right. And there is no power in it. Just just a, like a facade of, oh, we are this and we are that. In, in, in just this, it's just a, like the illusion. Of mm -hmm. something. But something as I would call it even minor as a COVID that could just shut down the whole city of Mashhad, which yeah. is the eighth imam of the Shia Muslims. It's like the shrine or the pilgrimage of Shia Muslims in the country. Mm -hmm. And that skull was closed six, eight, ten months. They're like this God is, and people are not not everyone questions it, but people are. There are people that they say, "What kind of God is this that sends this?" If if in the in the Islamic mindset, if God sends this disease, which that's the belief of a Muslim, everything is yeah from God, good or evil or whatever. How could God do that to to His own people? Right. Why and would they, God shut down Hajj? That's it. That's it. How and then this even causes more disillusion with Islam or distant even with Islam, especially mm -hmm. among the youth that are now connected via uh, other sources, their phones or they're like that. I have. Um, actually, let me share this quick testimony. Fourteen years old, thirteen years old, from a Saudi Muslim family, mm -hmm. told me as a result of our ministry, they have. Con she has converted. But mm. no one can know. So think about a 13 years old. Yeah. If it's a boy, it's a different deal. But th that age is like a she has received the Lord as young as being a 13 years old. But she's just keeping it to herself and just enjoying the freedom. She says, I'm not do I pretend to do the namaz, but I'm not doing it. Yeah. Salat. Yeah. And th this exciting moments. I believe with all of my heart, we're approaching the last hour of the last days. Yes. And there, there would be a great harvest, as the Bible has promised us. That's from every nation. And and then how the church is really ready to receive it. And then, there will, and of course, will come. But this gospel has to be preached among all every nations, nation. including the Husis of Yemen. Yes. We may not in the uh, Joshua projects or other statistics. We, we don't know if there is anybody that has heard the gospel in those, even in those tribal Islamic. They are of the world but i believe it all of my heart yeah i'm here brother again i can't share too many details but god is in the midst of a horrible humanitarian crisis in yemen god is god is doing great things there he is rescuing people there that's he is exciting. building his church there yeah that's exciting even with all of these things you with said, everything despite all of it mm -hmm. you can't stop the kingdom you cannot this is the one force you cannot stop it. Yeah. Many have tried from 
from Greeks to Romans, name it, to Muslim caliphs, yeah. uh, to communists, and name them. No, no, name them. They have tried to stop this thing, but it's going forth, and it will keep going forth. It's the best. The, the best thing we can do: humble ourselves and receive it. Yes. And um, I, I, I'm enjoying this conversation, but it's about an hour thirty minutes, brother. I don't want to take much of your time this time. I'm hoping you come back and uh, share more and sure. get, we, sh we get the knowledge of how, okay, we heard it's possible the conversions happens, but if we are in a, in our situations, how could we, how could you help us to understand more? Yeah. To reach out? I think we can do an, another hour on that. Sure. And uh, lastly, I would love to you to um, address the Muslims that are watching now or they will watch later about the gospel. What is it? And what it can do to, for them. Yeah. If you just share that, that would be phenomenal. Sure. Like what, what I would say to anyone out there, um, you know, it, it, if you're coming from a, a Muslim background, like, and you you don't like the things, anything, the things that I've said or Muhammad has said over this hour and a half, I totally understand. And I was once sitting in your same place, and I would have, and all the arguments that you would want to bring to me or to Muhammad. Believe me, like we've heard them all. We were the ones giving them. I, I used to be the guy attacking attacking the Christian evangelists and tearing apart the things they were. I was that person. So what did it take for me to go from where you're sitting to where I'm sitting now? Yeah. Is it took me being willing to humble myself enough to say, maybe I think I have all the answers, but maybe I don't. Maybe I think I know what the truth really is about who God is and what he's required of us. And maybe I don't, maybe I've made a mistake somewhere. Maybe someone even before me made a mistake somewhere. And that mistake was passed on generation after generation after generation. But the great thing is you don't have to just believe me. You don't have to believe Muhammad. We're nice people, but you, you know, mm -hmm. we could be wrong. What I would encourage you is seek the one who is the truth. Amen. Seek the Lord, seek God, open up your heart to him. Pray to him and humble yourself before him and ask him to lead you into the truth about who he is and what he's requiring of you. That's it. That's all. That's all I ask any Muslim person that I meet. If you do that and then be available, like use your ears. He gave you ears for a reason. Listen to what he responds, how he responds. Keep your eyes open. Pay attention to what yeah. begins to happen in your life after you ask him to show you something. Because he will, and he speaks in a variety of different ways. I'm sure Muhammad, you've heard so many testimonies as I have. Some people get dreams, some people get visions, some people, other things happen. Some people get just get invited by, into a family of people they never knew who accept them, who embrace them, and they experience God's love that way. There's a many different ways yes. that God will show, reveal himself to you. Be open to it. Be open to him and be brave. That's powerful, yes. And, and the only thing I would say, if Christianity is true, if Jesus is the only truth, would you accept it? Yeah. That's it. There is no, there is no other argument. Of the cost, and it will cost you something. If you're Muslim, believe me, we understand. It's, it's, not a, it's not a flippant decision. It's not an easy thing to count that cost. But count the cost, and you will find that Jesus is worthy. He's worth it. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much, brother. I, I really, really have the had the honor to have you on this program. It was, I mean, powerful. I am blessed. I believe a lot of our viewers now are watching today or they will watch later. They will be blessed. Praise God. And um, I pray that God uses this testimony, what he has done in your life, to be a witness among all many, many nations in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much. And if you don't have anything else, we can just close it. Okay. God bless you all, and uh, we'll see you on another live show.